Americans think of themselves as the richest, most prosperous people on earth, and by most measurements, that's true. We buy and sell more, make more, and have more things than anyone else. American science and higher education are the envy of the world. Our most ardent economic competitors still send their best minds here for final polishing. We drive more cars, trucks, and fly more planes than anyone else. We make more movies, play more golf, have more leisure time, and by most measurements still have the highest living standard of any nation on Earth. But Americans are a pragmatic lot, and there is growing concern that we are wasting a lot of our abundant resources and mortgaging our future. And for the first time in history, on a regular basis in peacetime, amid record prosperity, adult Americans are passing along to their children the obligation to pay for their lifestyle. We're facing perhaps the most critical test of our capacity for self-government, of our capacity to maintain our freedom. This is Joseph James, born October 19, 1989. He's healthy and strong and has a long life to look forward to, to the year 2060 if he's just average. He also has something else to look forward to, whether he likes it or not. A lifetime of debt and obligation. That's something that his parents and his grandparents, me in this case, have given him. The day that he was born, little Joseph here already owed $12,000, his share of the national debt. And Joseph's big brother, Austin over there, also owes $12,000, and so do each of his parents. Even the most prudent of parents cannot shield their children from this obligation. It's part of the built-in arrangement that's been made for them, generally without their complete knowledge or detailed approval. This family owes a $48,000 payment on the national debt. It's sort of like they went out and on top of all their other obligations bought a new Mercedes. And it's not just them, of course. It's you and me, too. Every man, woman, and child in America has a $12,000 payment due. The national debt, which is the running total of all of our yearly budget deficits, is difficult for most of us to comprehend. We don't deal with three trillion dollars very often. Think of it this way. The national debt is now over ten times everything the nation owed at the end of World War II, our biggest cataclysm in modern times. The interest alone on today's debt is equal to the entire debt in 1945, over 250 billion dollars per year. It now takes all of the individual federal income taxes from everyone west of the Mississippi River just to pay that interest. Conventional wisdom has it that we must eliminate the deficit and pay off the debt, and that there are only two ways to do it. One, to cut essential programs, or two, increase taxes. However, there is a growing body of opinion that holds a separate view, that there is a third alternative, that federal income taxes need not be raised, and that important programs need not be totally thrown out. That's what Citizens Against Government Waste stands for. In fact, the Controller General of the United States recently estimated that $180 billion a year is being squandered through waste, overcharges, abuse, and unnecessary programs. Well, if it is in fact true, let's say, that $180 billion is being wasted, uh, then if you look at the projection of the administration as to the budget deficit this time around, they're saying $63 billion. Let's say they're being optimistic and it's twice that much. As some people argue, it's more in the range of $120, $140 billion. $180 billion will cover that deficit with more left over besides. Uh, that means that if we vigorously prosecute the battle against the government waste, we'll do more than make a dent in the deficit. If we really worked at it, we could eliminate it entirely. It may seem frivolous to start with this, but I think you'll get the idea soon enough. This document, U.S. Government Number 54K12LM24, is 15 pages of detailed specifications issued by the Pentagon for one of its purchases. Type 2, sandwich. Each cookie shall consist of two round base cakes with a layer of filling between them. The weight of a cookie shall not be less than 21.5 grams, with the filling weighing not less than 6.4 grams. The base cake shall have been uniformly well-baked, with a color ranging from not lighter than chip 27885 or darker than chip 13711. The color comparison shall be made under sky daylight, with the objects held in such a way as to avoid specular refracture. 
the moisture content of the base cakes shall be not greater than 5.0% by weight. The filling shall be centered so that it does not protrude beyond the perimeter of the base cakes. The filling shall be fortified as specified in 3.2.3. The cookie shall be wholly intact, free of checks or cracks. The diameter of the cookie shall be such that the cookie can easily be placed in the required lined can. However, the diameter shall not be less than 2.616 inches. The cookie shall be tender and crisp and have an appetizing flavor free of a burnt or scorched flavor. The thing to remember about the cookie specifications is that someone, probably a committee, had to dream it all up, write it all down, get it approved, publish it, distribute it to prospective bidders, get the samples, test them, approve them, let the contract, and then make sure it was fulfilled. If it were just cookies, that would be one thing. But here are the Pentagon specifications for hand towels. 18 pages specifying a precise weave, a number of stitches, a measure of shrinkage. The specifications for t-shirt run 30 pages. This is why hammers cost $435, toilet seats $640, and coffee pots over $7,000. In recent congressional testimony, a deputy defense secretary promised to review 50,000 such military specifications. Carry this kind of detailed paperwork to its logical extreme and you have airplanes that cost $500 million apiece and still can't perform as required. Here's another airplane Americans are going to see a lot of. It's the new Air Force One, scheduled for delivery to the White House in September 1990. In planning since 1983, the original $235 million contract for two planes has escalated to $650 million plus $150 million for a hangar and other support units. Here's something that's a little easier to grasp. A high-quality fax machine goes for around $1,000 these days, yet the Air Force has contracted with Lytton Industries to buy one for $421,000 which includes spare parts. Actually, the deal calls for 173 of these gold-plated models for an initial outlay of $32.9 million plus $40 million for spare parts. The challenge at the Pentagon is to bring some sanity and logic to its purchasing procedures. Our military forces spend $170 billion a year, which is greater than the combined purchases of General Motors, Exxon, and IBM. 485,000 military and civilian personnel spend all or part of the working day buying and selling things for the Pentagon, 10,000 of them writing specifications. In the last few years, three major studies by well-respected nonpartisan organizations, the Grace Commission, the Packard Commission, and the General Accounting Office, have concluded that the cumbersome and wasteful procurement policies in the military must be reformed. They all agree that eliminating inter-service rivalries, buying more hardware off the shelf, contract modifications, and changes in the way spare parts are bought could save $7 billion a year. Taxpayers could save an additional $5 billion a year by closing obsolete or otherwise useless military bases. This one is often cited in the press as a good example, Fort Monroe on the Virginia coast. It was built to drive away the British Navy in the War of 1812, it was a massive Union staging area in the Civil War. It was rightly declared a National Historic Landmark 30 years ago and would make a fine museum. Yet it remains an active U.S. military installation. It's the only one with a moat. Fort Monroe, however, is one of those simple targets, a symbol that's easy to latch onto. The fact is not much could be saved by closing this base. It would cost about as much to maintain it as a museum, which is about all it's good for. It's totally open to the public. Moreover, it's the very place, the Training and Doctrine Command, that is charged with figuring out how to make the Army slimmer and more efficient in the 21st century. The real savings in base closings will be made in the larger facilities that lend themselves to some other use. Altogether, the U.S. military maintains nearly 4,000 domestic bases, and closing them is often politically unpopular. Many people are rightly concerned that jobs will be lost and local economies will suffer. The issue was so intractable that it took a special commission appointed by Congress to address the problem. Representative Richard Army of Texas was the author. First of all, of course, the Grace Commission report made it clear that the need was there, the savings could be made, and that we could find a way to decrease military costs without uh, diminishing our ability to fulfill the mission of the Defense Department. 
Clearly, there is a defined necessary mission for defense to protect the, the safety, current and future, of my children. Any expenditures in defense should be expressly for that purpose. And I'm, I'm what I call a tight wad hawk. I would spend every dime necessary to keep my children safe, but want to spend no, no dime more. Are jobs lost in the base closings? Are local economies decimated? A look at the record shows an interesting picture. Between 1961 and 1986, 100 former defense bases were acquired for civilian reuse. In that time, over 93,000 defense jobs were lost, but 138,000 civilian jobs were created to replace them. The bases have been turned into industrial parks, into airports, into 12 four-year colleges, and 33 vocational schools. Getting the federal government to turn loose of land, however, is not always as difficult as you might suppose. You want a piece of Nevada? Here's how you do it. First, find some land that the federal government owns. It's not a national park or a wilderness area. This shouldn't be hard because the federal government owns 85% of Nevada. Second, stake a claim for a hard rock mineral like gold, silver, lead, iron, or copper. Third, perform at least $100 worth of work on the land a year. And finally, buy the land from the government for as little as $2.50 an acre. All of this is perfectly legal under the provisions of a law enacted in 1872 at 1872 prices. The thing is, you don't really have to do any mining to keep the land, and you don't have to pay any royalties if you do, or if you sell the land. In 1986, the government sold 17,000 acres of land for $42,000, and a few weeks later, the patent holders turned around and sold the same land to major oil companies for $37 million. More recently, the government processed 12 properties estimated to have a commercial value of $47 million. By far the biggest one of them, a 1,200-acre tract here near the booming casino town of Laughlin, Nevada. These 12 tracts could have been sold for as little as $16,000, while the one property here at Laughlin was valued at $30 million. Perhaps because of the embarrassing publicity, this particular application was withdrawn. But there's another parcel near the Breckenridge Ski Resort in Colorado. Purchase price, $150. Potential value, $8 million. It's estimated by the Citizens Against Government Waste that $225 million could be saved in fiscal year 1990 alone by reforms in the way the government disposes of excess property, just collecting the fair market value for the land. The federal government is not only the largest landholder in the nation, but it's also the largest lender. Over the years, the government has lent out over $750 billion. Today, $220 billion is outstanding and 14% of it is not being repaid. That's $32 billion in delinquent loans, a number that has doubled in just the last six years. $32 billion is more than all the money collected from individual taxpayers in the state of New York. Moreover, another $60 billion is outstanding in unpaid federal income taxes. Citizens Against Government Waste estimates that simple reforms, agency incentives, and improved tax collections could save $5 billion a year. And I think most people in this country would be very surprised to know that there is nobody in the government who is charged really with the responsibility of keeping track of all the money. There are hundreds of different accounting systems in the government. There's no one unified accounting system. And that means that at any given moment, there's no one person in the government who can put his finger on every dollar that's out there. Many programs which cost taxpayers millions of dollars a year started off in answer to a definite need, then evolved over the years into something entirely different. The Coast Guard is one of those. Conceived as a quasi-military organization to police this country's vast coastline, the Coast Guard today spends nearly half its budget on services that benefit only private boatmen. Emergency rescue services, aids to navigation, free maps, etc. This costs taxpayers, even those who live thousands of miles from the nearest commercial yacht club, $860 million a year. And when you consider the fact that uh, many of the yacht owners uh, who are receiving the benefit 
of the Coast Guard services and resources have the money in their own uh, personal bank accounts to pay for services rendered, it really seems to me to be unconscionable that we don't have a user's fee uh, for towing yachts that are stranded and the like. Not to take anything away from the Coast Guard, but the fact is that in this particular area, they can save lives, but also ask the people who are benefit, benefiting from it to pay something for that service. Another program that has failed to keep pace with the times is the Federal Power Marketing Administration. This program was created in the Depression to sell cheap power from government-built dams. And that they do, even today, at the expense of taxpayers who do not live near the huge dams. Over the years, the government has loaned the PMAs over $16 billion. $13 billion is still outstanding. The interest rates on the loans are as low as 2% in some cases. Since the government has to borrow at market rates the money it loans to the PMAs, this amounts to a massive subsidy for a lucky few. Electricity bills for those receiving the subsidy are often less than half of those paying for the subsidy. The situation is well illustrated here at Hoover Dam on the border between Nevada and Arizona. The federal government sells power here for one cent per kilowatt hour when the wholesale rates in this area are four to eight times that amount. If the subsidized rates were brought into line with the rest of the nation, the loan repayments would reduce the federal deficit by nearly four billion dollars over the next five years. Incidentally, a portion of the subsidized power generated here at Hoover Dam goes to light the casinos in Las Vegas. The federal deficit could be reduced by another $5 billion by reforming the Rural Electrification Administration, the REA. This program, created in 1935 to bring electricity to farmers, did that years ago. Today, 99% of all farms have electricity and 96% have phones. Yet, since 1973, $18 billion in taxpayers' money has been appropriated for the REA, an amount which has raised the number of farms with electricity by only three-tenths of 1%. This New Deal program in the 80s has built power lines for such resort areas as Hilton Head, South Carolina and Vail, Colorado. Speaking of farms, federal outlays for farm programs are expected to total $130 billion between 1986 and 1990. That's over $61,000 for every farm in America. If you're a family of four, that's added over $2,000 in hidden costs to your grocery bills. Farm supports are intended to tide over this nation's crop producers in lean years and ensure a stable supply of food for all of us. But not all farmers are treated equal, and some of the programs don't make any sense. The folklore of American farm policy is that it is a program that exists to assure the American people of a stable food supply. That's pure humbug. The fact is, every place where we have chronic surpluses of production and waste of our resources is in those crops where there is a program to manage supply. For example, some farmers receive a subsidy in the form of cheap irrigation water. However, a recent Department of Agriculture study found that over half these farmers were growing crops that were already in surplus. The government, of course, buys the surplus. And to end this one instance of double dipping in the farm sector would save over $800 million per year. On the subject of double dipping, the federal pension system permits this in the extreme. It's possible and quite legal for a former federal worker and or office holder to collect multiple pensions. In some cases, the retirees make more money than the persons who now hold their old jobs. Hastings Keith is a man who is by no means an exception. A World War II veteran, former Massachusetts congressman, then a Nixon administration employee, Keith retired at the age of 58. In the last 17 years, he's collected over $800,000 from the federal government in civil service retirement, military benefits, and social security payments without working a day. What's his annual take? And about 90 grand a year, which works out to be about $43 uh, an hour for a 40-hour week. For doing nothing? For doing nothing. Well, I, I busy myself with protestations uh, of the pension system. If you looked at the federal retirement plan costs, currently and in the future, going from about $5 billion when the Grace Commission first studied it back into 1970 to when they wrote their report, which was about 1983 or 4, 
it had gone from five billion to about, uh, oh, I think 20 billion. Now it's up to about 50 billion. You tried to give some of it back, didn't you? Uh, I wrote uh, Secretary of Treasury, Regan, and I pointed out that my pension was going up faster than the pay of the, of the incumbent congressman. But when I wrote and suggested that, we, that I give him back the checks, um, he was not interested. Is something like bankruptcy in store for the federal government? I recall when I wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal some years ago, quoting Einstein, uh, who said when he was asked what was man's most important invention, he didn't say the wheel or the lever, he said compound interest. And I think when you consider these liabilities that are compounding at an average rate of perhaps six or seven percent a year, uh, that uh, uh, they will overwhelm our uh, financial system. How does the average federal pension compare to those in the private sector? The federal retiree is on the gravy train. How do these unfunded liabilities compare to the savings and loan crisis that we've been reading so much about? The SNLs is considered by some to be a nu of nuclear dimension in its damage potency, but this is thermonuclear. Right now, the unfunded liabilities of the federal pension system total over $1 trillion, and that's not counted as part of the national debt. So in addition to the $12,000 every man, woman, and child in America owes on money that's already been borrowed by the federal government, each person has an additional liability of another $4,000 for future pensions. This family of four owes not $48,000, but $64,000. Airline deregulation was supposed to have gotten the federal government out of the scheduling business, and in most cases it has. But in others, the government pays heavy subsidies to keep planes flying into small towns where there is hardly any traffic. Here are just a few. On an average day, only four passengers fly to and from Denver and McCook, Nebraska, yet the government pays the commuter airline over $222,000 a year, which amounts to a subsidy of over $90 per passenger. Two and a half passengers a day fly between Paris, Texas and Dallas-Fort Worth. The subsidy amounts to $143 per ticket. The government pays over $200,000 a year to maintain air service between Yankton, South Dakota, and Omaha for fewer than two passengers a day, $182 per ticket. And it was designed after deregulation so that Congress and, of course, the Department of Transportation would have some money available to give to small communities that had lost regular air service. It was certainly a noble intention, and I think it, it worked well at the outset. Uh, we provided subsidies for air passengers so that the commuter airline would not pick up and go away. The 10 years of the program passed, 10 years of deregulation, it was supposed to phase out. It was reauthorized and it's still on the books. Each year we fought a losing battle to either cut down the program dramatically or even eliminate it. Now I think there's some communities that might need some help, but when you look at some of the more outrageous examples of the subsidies that are being paid for airline passengers, it really is difficult to justify. These items are just a tiny part of the larger issue known around here as the pork barrel. These are appropriations no. often Mr. passed Demato. in the closing hours of the congressional session Mr. when Demato. debate hardly exists I. that benefit only Mr. the friends or constituents of one Mr. congressman or senator. No. Even Mr. though a lot of the bills are small, Mr. the truth is there are a lot of them. I went to the floor with a Republican colleague from Texas and just went uh, straight into the teeth of the uh, lion here trying to uh, abolish this program a couple years ago. We lost, and it was a terrible loss. It wasn't even close. Pork barrel legislation amounts to $4 billion a year, which is almost the entire budget of the Justice Department. Put another way, that $4 billion amounts to a blank check of almost $7.5 million that is put into the hands of every senator and congressman on Capitol Hill. Clearly, it's impossible for any one person, especially someone who lives far away from here, to keep track of how all this money is spent. In a lot of cases, the government itself doesn't even know or doesn't find out for years. There is no one person or agency charged with looking for waste in government. 
That's one of the reasons we have seen in recent years the rise of citizens' groups who do nothing but monitor spending and alert their members so they can contact their senators and congressmen to try to reduce it. One of the most energetic of these organizations is Citizens Against Government Waste, an outgrowth of the famous Grace Commission. The head of the commission, Peter Grace, was fond of noting how ridiculous some programs are. Here's my candidate for the first member of the Hall of Shame. Now this letter was sent to me by one of our supporters as a glaring example of waste, and it's addressed to the Secretary of Agriculture. It reads as follows. Dear sir, my friend Ed Peterson over at Wells, Iowa, received a check for $1,000 from the government for not raising hog. So I want to go into the not raising hogs business next year. <laughs> As I see it, the hardest part of this program will be in keeping an accurate inventory of how many hogs I hadn't raised. <laughs> now, my friend Peterson is very joyful about the future of this business. He's been raising hogs for 20 years or so, and the best he ever made on them was $422.1968, until this year when he got your check for $1,000 for not raising hogs. <laughs> I plan to operate on a small scale at first, holding myself <laughs> down to about 4,000 hogs not raised, which will mean about $80,000 the first year. Now, another, another thing, these hogs I will not raise will not eat 100,000 bushels of corn. I understand that you also pay farmers for not raising corn or wheat. <laughs> well, I qualify for payments for not raising wheat and corn not to feed the 4,000 hogs I'm not going to raise. <clears throat> also, I'm considering the not milking cows business. <clears throat> so please send me any information on that, too. Officially known as the President's Private Sector Survey on Cost Control, the Grace Commission identified budget savings of over $424 billion in its report delivered in 1984. Between 1986 and 1989, over $152 billion has been saved through direct implementation of Grace Commission recommendations. Citizens Against Government Waste is aiming for the rest and the additional billions that pile up each year. The president of Citizens Against Government Waste is Alan Keyes, a former U.S. ambassador and former assistant secretary of state. Keyes has seen budget mismanagement from inside the government and understands the magnitude of the battle to control it. Well, I think that when you analyze the problem, the sources in Washington are pretty clear. You've got a political system in which our legislators and representatives tend, I think, to be very responsive to the interests of special interests that are interested in spending money. You have a bureaucratic interest where the incentive now is not to save or to be efficient, but to expand, to spend more money, to build a bigger bureaucratic empire. I think it's going to be very difficult to deal with this problem just from the Washington perspective. That means that the key, in my opinion, uh, is not in identifying what needs to be done in a specific sense. Reports are coming out all the time, Inspector General's reports, General Accounting Office studies, studies that are done by private institutions around Washington and elsewhere. We know what needs to be done. It's a question of not having the political will to take those steps. And where's that going to come from? In a democracy, it can only come from the people. Uh, if folks around this country who are paying the taxes that support this government are going to sit on their hands, if they're going to continue to send people back to Congress, and 99% of the people in the House were reelected. Uh, with the government waste at the level that it's at, with the national deficit rising, with the national debt approaching $3 trillion, if we just send folks back to Washington, what does this sell them? We're patting them on the back and saying, job well done, please do it to us some more, waste some more, spend some more, have the deficit go up some more. Uh, if we want to see something done about this problem, people are going to have to stop taking it lying down. They're going to have to become informed, and they're going to have to get involved in the effort to put pressure on Washington to change the spend-waste mentality into a mentality that puts the emphasis on savings and on the most efficient use of the taxpayer's dollar. How is Citizens Against Government Waste different from other watchdog agencies here in Washington? We have about 350,000 members now. Uh, we work on continuing the push for the implementation of Grace Commission ideas, uh, and we also work as a watchdog agency, identifying new areas of government waste. Through our Council of Citizens Against Government Waste, we work on Capitol Hill to try to push for the kind of legislation that will implement proposals that will help to eliminate wasteful practices and bring the, the government's uh, spending down, the waste down, and do something about the national deficit and national debt.
What do you say to a person who you want them to send your money? What are they going to get when they send you money? What do they get in return? Well, I think first of all, we're going to get immediate savings in the areas that we talk about that will help to keep taxes down. Second, we're going to get hopefully a more efficient and effective government. It's one of the reasons why this is not a partisan issue. It's not an ideological issue. It's a common sense issue for people who want to see the government do the best it can for the people of this country. And finally, I think there's a larger question involved. Uh, and it's the one that I myself think is most important. We're a democratic society. We were founded over 200 years ago by folks who thought that it was important to prove that people, ordinary people, they didn't have to be rich, they didn't have to be educated, they didn't have to be aristocrats and kings and so forth, that they could in fact devise a system of government and govern themselves. Well, Hamilton, when he wrote the Federalist Papers, made it clear the test of that government he said would be, would it be able to maintain a good administration? Would it be able, in fact, to make effective use of resources? Uh, because it had always been said by the philosophers that that's where democratic government would fail. And that's what we're facing right now. We're facing perhaps the most critical test of our capacity for self-government, of our capacity to maintain our freedom. So for people out there who are interested in their tax bills and who are interested in trying to keep interest rates down so the government uh, doesn't drive them up by borrowing money, there's a practical concern. And for people who are a little bit interested in the future of this country, who want to guarantee that the American dream will still exist for our children and our grandchildren, and who want to make sure that they will enjoy what I call the dignity of real self-government and freedom, uh, there's something in it for those people as well, for the people who care about this country's future and who want to make sure that it fulfills its destiny. Citizens Against Government Waste is a way for individual taxpayers to have a direct impact on how their money is spent, or better yet, saved, in Washington. Over 350,000 people have already joined. For more information, simply call this toll-free number, 1-800-USA-DEBT. That's 1-800-872-3328. Uh, when you're dealing with a trillion two hundred billion dollars, the billions lose significance. Uh, and I think you get into a situation where folks, whether it's on the Hill or in the bureaucracy, get used to throwing around these numbers with large zeros behind them and forget what it takes to make each and every one of those dollars. When you deal in billions, you forget that for the average family in this country, the people who are working two jobs to make ends meet, the folks who are trying to save a little money so they can get the house they've always dreamed of, the people who are trying to save to put their kids through school, that money means means a great deal to them. A few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars here or there can be the difference between fulfilling a dream and seeing a kid sent off to school or not fulfilling it. And that means that the folks in this country are making the sacrifices that are necessary, but the money gets to Washington, it's added up in this big trillion dollar budget, and we forget the blood and the sweat and the sacrifice that it takes to put those dollars into the hands of our government.